Well, how's it going guys? John here with another video for ArtQuest. This time I'm doing a Conan the Barbarian painting and, you know, this video could have easily been, because it's about four hours compressed into about a half hour here, so this is sped up quite a lot. And this could have easily been a longer video for uh, subscribe star supporters and, you know, everyone like that, but I thought it'd be a fun video to just do here as well. And uh, maybe talk about some other things as well. So. I'm a big fan of Frank Frazetta. Uh, he's a huge influence on me and my work. I think the moment I saw his artwork, I realized, like, man, this guy, if I could be half as good as this guy, that would be amazing. So I didn't show the boring part of getting the line work, and actually I used uh, a feature, which I will probably do a video on, that is pretty awesome in Clip Studio Paint, and that is 3D models. You can use uh, 3D models of figures, and you can pose them and get them in interesting poses. And uh, I used that to, to get the poses of both characters here. And then uh, did my sketches over the top of those, and my line work and everything. And it really helped. It was a super useful, useful skill. And uh, I think using 3D models as a base is a pretty useful tool. Uh, we use it all the time for things like vehicles and mechs and environments, so why not use it for figures too? especially when you're on a deadline and you know I'm trying to get away from photo bashing which there's no photo bashing in this image but you still want to look for maybe time saving skills and abilities and, and tools that you can use to make your uh, your process and your workflow faster and the fact that Clip Studio Paint has 3D model support built in it is super useful but if I had added that this video would be way too long already and didn't want to do that so just suffice it to say, I used that, and uh, then later, you know, did my line work, and now we're at the point here where, where I'm working on values, and I'm really starting to, I feel like, hone my own personal workflow of what I like to do and, and how I like to do it. I would say that uh, I think my preferred method is to work in line work. So, for the October subs uh, subscribe star supporter video. I did Ungoliant and Morgoth as a painting, an il illustration from Tolkien's Silmarillion, and I used that one to go from line work to value to color, and then I spent a lot of time building up the colors and val uh, values at the same time, but for me it's just much easier, I think, to get my values sorted first, uh, just because I'm not a, I don't feel like a super, super talented artist quite yet. Uh, I have a lot to learn, and, and just building up from color is just a skill I can do sometimes, but I can't rely on it all the time to be as effective as I'd like as I'd like it to be. So working from line art to uh, grayscale and then to color is, I think for me, how I'm, I'm going to just continue to, to do my work. It just seems to be the best and easiest way to do it. And... Um, just for me, separating value from color um, is a good way for me to make sure that my values are correct. If if you're a supporter and you saw my Ungoliant painting, you can see the the error that I make in um, in creating everything. I, I start trying to go from colors from the beginning, and it just doesn't work because I was so neglectful of values as I was working on color, and I just think I need more practice at it personally. Uh, I'm not afraid to say that, that that's a skill that I greatly lack, and uh, going from, starting from color from the beginning means that you got to think about value and color at the same time, and I just think that's, uh, that's too much for my brain to handle at the moment, and I need, I need a little more practice with that. But anyways, uh, I enjoy working from grayscale, I enjoy, I enjoy just doing, you know, uh, monochromatic sketches. Th those are oftentimes a lot of fun and super useful. And understanding value is a way to make sure that your colors are going to be correct because value and color are they are in fact linked to each other. They are inseparable. It's just that I, th in my view, uh, value is a precursor to color. So it's a it's a foundation upon which color rests on. And if your values in your painting are not right, then your painting is not going the colors that you have. Even if you have sound color theory and the colors you pick, your painting isn't going to look good. It's not going to look right. So, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of been my view on that. And 
I'm really enjoying it, it's for me I think a lot less stressful to not to force myself to not rely on photo bashing so I really enjoyed this painting and I felt more accomplished doing this illustration uh, you know I had the help of 3d but like as far as the rendering is concerned not relying on photo textures and just painting everything by hand made me feel good it made me feel accomplished and like I'm painting and I think that's my my gripe for me personally again I've, I'm not the one to rag on one technique and say it's better than another but uh, it's just not for me, as I've mentioned many times before in other videos. It's just not a technique that I think I care to use. So, but you know, I I really I, I'm I'm relatively happy with the way this painting turned out. I think maybe Conan's skin is a little too like bronze, but I think it works too. He's a barbarian. He runs around with no shirt on and and uh, you know kills things. So it's it's fine. Uh, I did run into a problem later, I corrected it after I recorded the video uh, here, where the woman's torso is like a lighter skin tone than her legs, and it just looked weird, and it's, it was something that looked weird, and I didn't know what it was until I sat there and stared at it for a while, and, and realized, like, oh, well, that's because half of her body is a different color. Uh, so that's something I need to pay attention to and, and just be more aware of. And also, you know, I will say I didn't really use much reference for anatomy with this. Um, again, I use the 3D models as a base, but they're not very defined anatomy as far as the models are concerned. Uh, they're not, they don't show things as clearly like how muscles pull and expand and contract or anything like that. The hard edges, the bony structures of, of the body in comparison to the um in comparison to like the softer forms of the body so while it is a useful tool to use the 3d models in clip studio paint it isn't necessarily entirely a crutch you still have to have an understanding of anatomy because the info that it gives you is is mostly just silhouette and some lighting and that's about it you still need to understand and extrapolate uh your own values your own so, for instance, the models that it comes with are not as bulky as I would need them to be for a Conan the Barbarian painting. So, really, I'm just using it as a silhouette. Like, I'm plopping it on there. That's pretty much what I did. I'm plopping it on there as a silhouette, and how can I expand on it and build up? Because I had to bulk up that model. And that does take some, some understanding of anatomy, which I'm not the best at. I have, I think, a better understanding than some amateur artists, but at the same time, uh, I'm not I'm not an expert. I've taken quite a few figure drawing courses, and it's figure drawing is still something that like just escapes me sometimes, and I fail at horribly. And I probably should have looked at more reference for this painting, but sometimes, and this is a, a Dave Raposa sort of... Uh, a uh, little nugget here. Sometimes looking at a uh, at reference can kind of skew your understanding of uh, of what you're trying to make. And sometimes doing something from memory, if you have enough knowledge about it, I'll have that as a as a as a precursor. If you put enough time in, which not saying that I necessarily have, but just that. I've tried to do a lot of figure drawing over the years since I got into art in 2012. Serious, since I seriously got into art in 2012. Did art before that in high school and everything. But I felt relatively confident that I could get the anatomy close. Close enough to where it's not going to raise too many eyebrows. And I think the part where I struggled the most was under the pectorals and on the sides where like your ribs are. I don't know the name of that muscle, it's escaping me right now, uh, but it, it's like, it looks like these tight little fingers almost of muscle groups there that uh, kind of point towards the abdominals, and I I know I didn't get the shapes right on that, but I just tried to do the best I could. I think I did look at a few references, but nothing was in that exact pose that I could find that was needed for me, and I didn't look that hard, honestly, I just did a quick... Uh, 
DuckDuckGo image search and then just gave up because I just wanted to get this image done. And so I, I just tried to get it as best as I could. And I think it looks okay. Uh, there's anatomy experts out there and artists that could probably look at my painting and be like, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And I think that's probably always going to be the case with my art and my figure drawing. And so I have to, at a certain point, just ignore that and uh, be okay with the fact with, with the slower incremental growth that I have in my art. So one other thing I wanted to talk about in this video uh, and maybe provide some advice and, and kind of talk about my own personal experiences because that's what this channel is mostly about. I, I'm trying to steer away from tutorials. I don't feel like I'm as good of an artist. I'm not a Mark Burnett or I'm not uh, Ethan Zana. I'm not uh, Dave Raposa. I'm not these guys that are like amazingly amazing at their art. Those guys have much more time put in to their work and uh, for me uh, I'm, I'm still in very much the beginnings and the learning phase even though I've been at this for like almost eight years um, art has been kind of like a love-hate relationship over those eight years where I've tried to consistently do art for two years uh, or for two hours every day and then you know I'd go six months without painting and most recently I went about four or five months Earlier this year, once my daughter was born and this uh, pandemic started, this COVID-19 stuff went down, I I just didn't have the energy or the time. And it, I felt bummed out because I saw a lot of artists that I admired and follow talk about like, yeah, you know, this lockdown sucks, but, you know, I'm just trying to use the time productively and and uh, get um, my, my skills honed in and get better and become a better artist. And I really feel like to some degree, I squandered that time that I've had uh, over, over this year. That could have been a bright, shining thing in 2020. But also, the birth of my daughter was extremely important and tiring, and that's also probably the brightest point of 2020 for me. So it, it helps put things and priorities in perspective for me as well. But I wanted to talk about how hard it is to make it uh, and just accomplish something in art and how difficult this is. You know, we're, this is an industry where there's a million people like me. There's a million people that are moderately talented and that's probably being overly gener generous with my own self, but they're moderately talented. Uh, they have a copy of Photoshop. They have a tablet. They, some of them are even more talented than moderately talented and they don't make it. And there's a lot of people out there that are not very good at all. And you're just a lost voice in all of that. That's how I have kind of felt. And, you know, I think maybe a lot of you could probably sympathize with me in that as well. Like, you just feel like a lost voice out there. You're screaming out there saying, look at my art. I'm decent. Like, someone hire me. And it's, it's, uh, it's hard to be heard. And I don't know what the solution to that is. For me, I've mentioned in other videos how I made lists of, of uh, clients that I wanted to work for looked at the art that they produced in their products. So for me, it's like tabletop RPGs and board games and stuff like that. I'm really trying to move towards illustration rather than uh, rather than concept art. Although I still do concept art when it comes across to me because like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna turn money and work away if if that's the case. But um, it it made me think about a couple other things in this process. So one thing I thought about is what's what's the validity of, for instance, of creator-owned product of, of projects and products. And I think if you're able to do that, I think that's the best thing you can do because there are so many times when I, when the few freelance bits of freelance work that I get, where I get something and I disagree with the direction the art director wants to go, but I have to do what they say because maybe they obviously some see something in the product that my small scope view doesn't have and I just have to trust that it's I'm being hired to to do what they want me to do um, and that's that's just my my role in it so I gotta buckle down and do it the beauty of a creator owned project is that you get to make what you want to make and whether that succeeds or fails is another story and another issue but you have that creative control you can do what you want to do and you are free to do it 
So for me, you know, I'm working on a comic with a friend of mine. Uh, we're still kind of trying to parse out the story. I'm still trying to figure out the art style for the comic and kind of whether or not I want to go traditional uh, art for the comic or uh, do my inking and illustrations for the comic in Clip Studio Paint here. I'm, I'm undecided because I, I have a little soft spot for pen and ink drawings and... Um, that look and feel in the, that process of working with with pen and ink. I, I think that's probably one of my favorite traditional mediums is brush pen or pens or uh, you know calligraphy using those calligraphy pens and whatnot to to sketch out your work. I really I really kind of enjoy that that process. So I'm I'm in that phase right now, or we're in that phase, figuring out the story and and all that kind of stuff. And we'll probably try and pitch it to some publishers, but ultimately we'll probably end up self-publishing because it's not going to be a very necessarily politically correct comic, and it's not going to be something that I think maybe a lot of um, mainstream publishers will want. So I think going direct to people that want to buy it, uh, because I think people out there are hungry for stories that are not necessarily... Not it's purposely harmful to people and PC, but that like, it doesn't need to have this overwhelming um, political agenda to it, I guess, of a certain type, if you know what I'm talking about. And I think you do. It doesn't need to have that, and this, this comic isn't going to have that. And so being able to do it ourselves and control it ourselves and sell directly to the people that want to have it is extremely useful but obviously you run into the problems of you don't have the same pool as like an image comics or if you're working on an indie video game like you might have an amazing idea for an amazing game but you know you're not EA you're not Bethesda you're not um, you're, you're not Bungie you're not these big studios that like have big marketing budgets and big publishers backing them that can really get the word out and get people to buy your game uh, it's got to be mostly by word of mouth, and I think I read somewhere that most indie games, even if they're really good ones, make only about ten grand in the first year of sales. And it probably, I think it picks up after that as maybe word of mouth spreads. But like, it's an it's an initial rough investment of time and effort, and and oftentimes money. So, and and that's how a lot of creator owned projects are. So there, there's that part there. You got to really trust in your product and what you're making and your idea. And uh, you got to stick with it, and you got to—you're in it for the long haul with that. And you're bearing the burden, you're bearing the cost of it failing. Um, and so that's why I wanted to talk about these other things. I've been in a, quite a few projects. I'm not going to name names, but I've been in quite a few projects that were uh, not the best for me, and I felt like I was taken advantage of. So I'll talk about the first one. The first one was a video game for a very popular uh, intellectual property. I'm not going to say which one, but a popular intellectual property. I was put on as a concept artist with the promise of profit sharing, and they told us uh, through contracts all these things. And I, there's probably a lawsuit that could be done against these people, but I just don't have the time and energy to deal with it. And it was so long ago. This was like 2014 or something like that. I wasn't necessarily a very good artist. Uh, but for this IP, they, they told us they had permission from the current IP holder. They showed they had this intellectual property holder's logo all over their contracts and all that stuff. It was, and, and so it seemed legit. And as you know, I had just barely started my journey in 2012. This is 2014. I'm only two year, two or three years in on this journey, and I'm working on this project, and it just got shut down. Um, these people brought their project to Kickstarter, and we were those of us that were not in leadership of this project, just, you know, worker drones, were shocked when we heard that the project got a cease and desist order from the intellectual property holder. And so for me, that was a shock. And I was like, holy crap, I need to do my research a little better. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm foolish looking back, like, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but looking back on it, you know, I could see that doing it uh, uh, high stakes, a high um, visible, a highly popular intellectual property like what I was working on should have been a giant red flag to me. But 
uh, I was new. No one told me otherwise, and it seemed legit. You know, had the IP holders uh, logo on things. It seemed like I was signing contracts directly from that intellectual property holder. When a simple probably contact to um, the intellectual property holder would have probably sorted it out for me, and I wouldn't have wasted a good five, six months of my time. So, that's the first story. Um, and I think the lesson from that is if you see a project and they're not explicit that like, uh, for instance, Sky Oblivion, for instance, you understand that this is just for experience. This is a mod, there's no monetary gain from it. Uh, and we're working on a high profile intellectual property that we don't have the, the distribution rights to. If they're not being honest and forthright, like for instance, these Skyrim mods are, then don't do it. Um, you're being taken advantage of. Second story. So I thought I learned my lesson and went to another profit sharing um, thing, a uh, video game project. And this one was uh, its own IP. So it wasn't linked to anything new. So I'm like, okay, that red flag isn't going up. And it seemed like from what I saw and from what the person was pitching to me that the uh, project was legit. Like, they were making great progress. Um, there was a lot of amazing work being done. And I put two years of work into this project, and it failed. And um, not that it failed. It's still going on right now. But I left because it was stressful for my wife to be spending a lot of time and effort on this project that didn't seem to have any return in sight because the, the release date for this game kept getting pushed back. And... Um, it was just a nightmare for me and for my family. And so I, I walked away from it. And I think the conclusion I came to was, you know, if I'm going to do something like this, it needs to be a much smaller group of people. Because this project, this second project, had like quite a, quite a number of people working on it remotely. And... That should have been the other big red flag, is the high turnover rate at this uh, profit-shared project that had been in development for a very long time, is still in development now, and there's a ton of people working on it, and, and it's not out yet. So that, that kind of brought it to the forefront in my mind that, okay, these are the new red flags that I have. And I'm passing these on to you so that maybe those of you that are out there cannot fall into the same pitfalls and problems that I had. And so that brought forward the other issue where I came to the conclusion that the red flags are don't do IPs that are huge but profit shared. So like, hey, we're making a, a, a Mass Effect game. We don't have the IP to it, but we got permission from from the IP holder. We got permission from Bioware and EA. We're, we're totally legit. It's probably not legit. Don't work on projects that have massive teams that are profit-sharing pro projects. The team probably needs to be a lot smaller, a lot more concise, and a lot more cohesive. I think that that would provide an environment where there's a little more accountability. Because the bigger the team is on these profit-sharing indie projects, uh, the more shady activities that can go on. And so I think that either you as the artists need to be the one in charge of the, whatever project it is you're doing, whether it's a video game or a comic or a graphic novel or a novel or an art book or whatever it is, an RPG rule book or Kickstarter or something like that, you need to have a little more control and say in it because you can, if you fail, it's all on you and the burden is on you. And while it's scary, that is also going to hopefully keep you honest and you know what's going on. Or you need to know the people that in the project that you're working with, and you need to trust them. And they, like I said, need to be small teams, I think. And I think that's what I've learned through all this. And uh, while um, I wish that I had used my time a little more productively during those two projects that I just talked about, ultimately I'm glad I know those things. I can pass that wisdom, hopefully it's wisdom, to all of you out there that are maybe looking to get into the in industry, you can look at these projects. And, you know, the moment something seems fishy, don't be afraid to back away. 
Don't be afraid to say, this doesn't feel right. Uh, this doesn't seem right. Don't be afraid to walk away. That was part of my problem with the second project. It was like, man, it, I put an, a year and a half, two years into this. I can't walk away from it. I need it to be worth, you need it to be worth something. Well, is it worth it to just keep burning more of your time? They could be used towards finding other jobs or starting your own project. Is that, is that really worth it? I don't think so. I think the benefit is uh, to cut your losses as soon as you realize something's up and move on. I think that's the best way to go about it. So that's my story. Uh, that's um, kind of how everything came to be. Uh, follow me on Subscribestar. Hopefully this story was helpful, but follow me on Subscribestar. All my links will be in the video description. I really appreciate you guys watching this video. Hopefully it was helpful, and I'll, I'll catch you guys in the next video, and uh, hopefully it'll be another good one. Catch you guys later.